Although the late Eddie Van Halen is revered as one of the greatest guitarists of all time, his journey was not without personal struggles, and many were hurt on the musician's journey to overcome his demons. So let's uncover how Eddie Van Halen's influence can either make or break someone's career and find out where those he wronged are now, starting with his own bandmate, Michael Anthony, whom Eddie defrauded so severely that the band's longtime manager called it the most despicable act he'd witnessed in his 40 years in the music industry. You see, when the Van Halen band first formed in the early 70s, the band members along with manager Noel Monk agreed to be true partners, sharing all income equally. However, by 1984, after achieving unprecedented success with sold-out stadiums and millions of records sold, Eddie desired a larger share of the band's earnings. Given that Eddie wrote all the band's songs with frontman David Lee Roth, and his brother Alex was the band's drummer, it was bassist Michael Anthony who bore the brunt of Eddie's greed. And so, at the absolute height of Van Halen's success, Michael Anthony was pressured to relinquish his ownership stake in the band and forfeit all future songwriting credits and royalties, a move that reduced Anthony to a contract worker and ultimately deprived him of millions of dollars. Yet this was not the last time Eddie betrayed Anthony, a topic we will explore in greater detail later. For now, Eddie's greed continued to claim victims. Realizing he could seize even more of Van Halen's earnings, he decided to fire their longtime manager, Noel Monk, thereby reclaiming Monk's 20% equity stake in the band. Yet despite now earning more money than ever, the members of Van Halen were each hitting rock bottom in their personal lives, grappling with their own substance abuse issues. But the true catalyst for the band's internal collapse would prove proved to be the enduring resentment between Eddie Van Halen and frontman David Lee Roth. From the band's inception, it was evident that the two had vastly different artistic visions. Yet despite their differences, the songwriting duo of Eddie and Roth proved to be the perfect complement to one another, and their synergy led to the group's swift success. By the mid-1980s, however, years of creative battles had taken their toll, and tensions between them became even more pronounced. Eddie's pursuit of musical innovation was clashing with Roth's desire to stick to straightforward rock and roll, prompting Eddie to build his own home recording studio to create an isolation, free from Roth's interference. The singer, in turn, sought creative fulfillment by way of a solo career, with his debut EP Crazy From The Heat achieving significant success. Things became even more contentious when Roth aimed to launch his acting career by producing a Hollywood feature film inspired by his solo music. He even asked Eddie to write original music for the movie, a request Eddie flatly refused. This proved to be the final straw, because at that very moment, Roth told Eddie he could no longer work with him and quit the band, sparking a long-standing war of words between the two in the press. Yet perhaps Eddie's most notorious public rivalry was with legendary Ozzy Osbourne guitarist Randy Rhodes. As the two influential shred were frequently pitted against one another. Rhodes emerged from the same Los Angeles rock scene as Eddie, with Ozzy Osbourne recalling that the two musicians couldn't stand each other. Eddie was somewhat dismissive of Randy's playing, saying in one interview, he was good, but I don't think he really did anything that I haven't done. The Van Halen guitarist even went so far as to take credit for supposedly teaching Rhodes everything he knew about guitar, a statement that Osbourne vehemently denied. Osborne would tell Rolling Stone, I heard recently that Eddie Van Halen said he taught Randy all his licks. He never. To be honest, Randy didn't have a nice thing to say about Eddie. Maybe they had a falling out or whatever, but they were rivals. That statement was supported by Andre Rellis, the director of the Randy Rhodes documentary, Confessions of a Guitar Icon, who said there was real tension between the two guitarists from back when Rhodes's pre ozzy band Quiet Riot and Van Halen were peers on the Sunset Strip, each angling for a record deal. Rhodes's life was tragically cut short in a plane crash in 1982, with his rivalry with Eddie Van Halen remaining one of the most enduring debates in the guitar community. Nevertheless, Eddie's ability to play the guitar was once threatened by the infamous shenanigans of Motley Crue. Van Halen and the crew would tour together in 1984, with Crue drummer Tommy Lee recalling that this period of 
time aligned with what he refers to as the band's quote, crazy biting phase. Lee called to mind an incident where Motley Crue's singer Vince Neil bit Eddie Van Halen's hand. Understandably, Eddie was furious, as this reckless act endangered his ability to play guitar and threatened upcoming concerts. Crew manager Doc McGee has confirmed that this bite escalated into full-blown hostility between the two bands, noting that he had to apologize every day for the crew's antics. Eventually, Van Halen demanded Motley Crue be removed from the tour. However, due to the band's soaring popularity, such action proved difficult. To keep the peace, an unusual solution was found. For the remainder of the tour, Motley Crue's trailer was elevated several meters off the ground by a towering crane, effectively confining the band and preventing further mischief before their performances. Eddie would similarly spark a feud between Van Halen and progressive rock band Rush. The two bands would have a chance encounter in Leicester, England, when Van Halen hit the hotel bar to celebrate their bassist's birthday. Little did they know know that Rush had already rented the bar for themselves and prepaid for all the alcohol. Assuming the drinks were complimentary, the Van Halen crew began helping themselves to Rush's alcohol. Fortunately, Rush graciously chose to share their stash, igniting an impromptu party for the ages, with Rush singer Getty Lee serving as a makeshift DJ. But in an unfortunate mishap, Eddie Van Halen accidentally spilled beer on Getty's sound system, damaging it beyond repair and creating bad blood between the two bands. One year later, Getty Lee spotted Eddie at a Las Vegas casino and decided it was time to make amends. However, as he approached Eddie in hopes of reconciling, Eddie's security guards, unaware of who Lee was, tackled him and threw him across the room. And while Lee has since downplayed any lingering tensions between the two, the same cannot be said for Limp Bizkit frontman Fred Durst, who had his own confrontation with Eddie Van Halen. The two first crossed paths in 2001 when a record label executive introduced Durst to Eddie at a party. The exec suggested they collaborate, and both agreed to meet for a jam session. When the two finally got together at Durst's house, Eddie was profoundly disappointed by Durst's lack of musical talent. His dissatisfaction only grew when members of Durst's entourage began smoking marijuana, an activity Eddie disapproved of. Frustrated, Eddie made an abrupt exit, leaving his gear behind. After several unsuccessful attempts to contact Durst and retrieve his gear, Eddie decided to confront him directly, showing up at Durst's front door, brandishing a firearm, and demanding the return of his equipment. Eddie would recall, Fred answered the door. I put my gun to that stupid red hat of his, and I said, where's my stuff, mother And that guy just turned to one of his employees and starts yelling at him to grab my stuff. Eddie then allegedly stood by with his gun aimed at Durst's head, while Durst loaded Eddie's equipment back into his car. Eddie's extreme course of action could perhaps be attributed to his addiction spiraling out of control by this point in time, a reality witnessed firsthand by Van Halen's second lead singer, Sammy Hagar. Hagar first met Eddie back in 1985, when Eddie convinced him to fill the lead singer position in Van Halen, left vacant by David Lee Roth's departure. With Hagar on vocals, the band went on to release four multi-platinum selling albums. But despite their success, Hagar and Eddie's relationship steadily deteriorated over the years. By 1996, Hagar was taking time off to prepare for the birth of his son, Andrew. Nevertheless, Eddie insisted they record new music, prompting Hagar and his wife to reluctantly travel from their home in Hawaii to Los Angeles for what they expected to be a short trip. How However, by the time the Hagars were attempting to board their return flight, the couple was informed that the pregnancy had progressed too far for them to travel as planned. This unexpected news completely disrupted their carefully devised plan for a home birth. This led to a heated argument, culminating in Hagar's dismissal from Van Halen, which ironically occurred on Father's Day of 1996. Hagar and Eddie didn't speak until 2004, when Hagar received a call about a potential Van Halen reunion. He decided to visit Eddie at home to discuss it further. However, when Eddie answered the door, Hagar was appalled by what he saw. Hagar would recall in his memoir, I'd never seen Eddie so skinny in my life. He was missing 
missing a number of teeth, and the ones he had left were black. His boots were so worn out, he had gaffer's tape wrapped around them, and his big toe stuck out. He walked up to me, hunched over like a little old man, a cigarette in his mouth. He had a third of his tongue removed because of cancer, and he spoke with a slight lisp. In an effort to rescue Eddie from his downward spiral, Van Halen subsequently reformed with Sammy Hagar back on vocals and embarked on a 2004 tour, hoping it would revitalize Eddie's spirit. Sadly, the opposite occurred. Eddie's shocking appearance and drunken behavior on stage left fans heartbroken, as he no longer performed like the rock god he once was. The tour was made worse by the fact that bassist Michael Anthony was not allowed to participate unless he accepted a a substantial pay cut and relinquished all rights to the Van Halen name and logo. The bassist reluctantly agreed, with Hagar blasting Eddie for once again screwing Anthony. It's really irritating to see them go after Mikey. Mikey didn't do anything ever to Van Halen, never did anything to hurt those guys and they try to hurt him again and again and again. Eventually, Michael Anthony would be replaced in the band by Eddie's son, Wolfgang. However, Wolfgang's time in his father's multi-platinum selling band came with significant challenges. One particular incident where Eddie was too intoxicated to perform resulted in a heated confrontation between father and son. With this pivotal moment finally motivating Eddie to seek professional help and enter rehab. And so, thanks to his son's unyielding support, Eddie Van Halen at long last achieved sobriety in 2008. The guitarist would go on to live the rest of his days clean and sober, embarking on even more successful tours and even reconciling with both Roth and Hagar. Unfortunately, however, Michael Anthony would acknowledge that he and Eddie never would mend their relationship. Prior to his death in 2020, Eddie often expressed his gratitude to his son for saving his life. I'm just the luckiest father on the planet. I mean, for... for for what he's grown up in, he doesn't smoke, he doesn't drink, he doesn't do drugs. Uh, You're not so bad either. <laughs> anymore. <laughs>